Please give a warm welcome to the Vice President for Administration and Finance and the Chief Financial Officer for the National Champion University of Central Florida, Bill Merck. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, I have three things to do with you this morning. One is to say welcome, and I certainly mean that from the bottom of my heart. This is a, it's great to have this group here. The second is to say a few words about UCF as they relate to the topics of the symposium. And then the third is to introduce the, one of your keynote speakers, Jeremy Rifkin. So UCF is a fast growing university with a big population and even bigger goals. At UCF, we like to say that scale times excellence equals impact. We've had a lot of discussions about what that exactly means here at UCF, and we could, I'm not, but we could talk about that for a half a day with all the ramifications of it, but a short version of it goes something like this, in my mind at least. When you have a large organization like a UCF or a city of Orlando, the projects that you undertake can be large in scale. They can have a meaningful impact if they're done well. So at UCF, the scale, we have 66,000 students. We have an operating budget of about $1.7 billion a year. And we graduate about 18,000 students a year. So during that process of those 66,000 students going through their time here, and I was thinking about something that uh, Ron said about looking to, to the long term. Most of our students are younger. There are certainly exceptions, people like me that are coming back to retool, things like that. But the bulk of our students are younger. So the, the majority of their life is ahead of them. So the ideas about sustainability, the planet we live on, the environment that we're in, things that they learn here and practice here will have a major impact in, in the future for this planet. And I think that's really important, so I feel good about being part of an organization that can do that. Our growth provides opportunities to devise more efficient transportation, procure renewable energies, improve livability, and all the while, again, enhancing the student experience by keeping students involved in those projects that we undertake. Chris Castro was one of those students here that was involved in some of the projects we've been involved in. So like you, we recognize it's not enough to simply add sustainability to our list of things to do, but we must integrate the concepts into everything that we actually do. Bolstered by President Hitt's commitment to reaching carbon neutrality, we've had great success reducing operational costs, allowing savings to advance an education that is inclusive and diverse. So, actually doing something. How did some of these more recent uh, efforts get started? I know um, over 10 years ago, two things come to my mind. One is personal and the other is in my role as the chief financial officer. The personal thing is, is like you, I, I really enjoy breathing clean air. I actually do. And I like having access to clean water, which probably over a billion people on our planet don't have that luxury. So, and from a CFO standpoint, I mentioned how fast UCF has been growing. You could, I could see how um, over time with that growth, our energy bills could consume our operating budget to the detriment of our educational and research mis mission. So we put together a team of people um, to take a look at uh, improving our energy conserving energy and looking at sustainability as a whole. And those um, efforts have made a huge difference for us. Our efforts have generated approximately 25 million in cumulative cost savings to the point of not eating up the budget with energy costs. And thanks in, that, thanks in part to our high efficiency design and construction standards, we currently boast 19 LEED certified buildings with a minimum requirement of goal. Retrofits in existing buildings have led to a 40% reduction uh, per square foot since 2006. Now I'm gonna say that again because I'm always impressed every time I, I see that. Retrofits in existing buildings have led to a 40% energy consumption reduction per square foot. 
since 2006, and a 28% reduction in combined second or, or scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions per capita since 2007. So perhaps more importantly, our standing as America's leading partnership university and our investment in groundbreaking research is creating fertile ground for the aspiring change agents in our UCF community. We firmly believe that together we can reach our aggressive institutional and sustainability goals while continuing to graduate our students with a firm understanding and knowledge of the very difficult issues we are facing. Those are the things I wanted to say about UCF and how I think what we're doing relates to what you'll be talking about today. And we would want to continue to be your partners, our partner in everything that you do that can help us there. I said I had three things. The third thing is to introduce Jeremy Rifkin as a keynote speaker. Um, Mr. Rifkin has a bio in your program, so I won't go into too much detail about his background, but he's lived a full life, I'll tell you that, and a lot more to go. Some of the things that I was reading really impressed me, and I want to just highlight a couple of them. Jeremy Rifkin, he's an American economic and social theorist, writer, public speaker, political advisor, and activist. Um, he's been an advisor to the leadership of the European Union since 2000. He's a principal architect of the European Union's long-term plan called Smart Europe. And he's also been advising the leadership of the, public, of the People's Republic of China on the build out and scale up of the Internet Plus Third Industrial Revolution infrastructure to usher in a sustainable low carbon economy. And he's the president of TIR, con the consulting group. So with that, I'd like to um, ask Mr. Rifkin to come up and take over from here. And thank you again for being here. Good morning, everybody. Oh, put it down. I'm going to ask you all to put your cell phones away, turn them off. No iPads, OK? All right, thanks. I appreciate it. I'm, uh, I'm going to start on a little bit of a somber note this morning, and I'm hoping you'll see it as a liberating reflection, but you'll have to judge after we're done, okay? GDP is growing at a slower rate all over the world today. It has been for many years. And while the stock market is booming, it has almost no relationship to the real economy. We are 80% overvalued on this stock. We haven't seen anything like this since 1928. And the reason GDP is slowing all over the world is productivity has been declining all over the world for the last 10, 15 years. And the result is unemployment is very high, especially among the millennial generation desperately trying to find their place, their mission in a 21st century workforce. Our economists are projecting 20 more years of low productivity and slow growth. Let me do the numbers for you. After two industrial revolutions in the 19th and 20th century, here's where we stand this morning. Arguably, 50% of the human race, all of us, are far better off today than our ancestors were before we began this industrial experiment. Is that granted? Arguably, it's also true that 40% of the human race making $2 a day or less are maybe only a little bit better off than they were before we began the industrial age, and that's being charitable, and 1 billion people absolutely worse off than before we began the industrial age. So while half the human race has done better, the other half of the human race only marginally, the very rich have really done well. The eight richest people in the world today, we could put them at this table. The eight richest people in the world today's combined wealth now equals the accumulated wealth of one half the human beings living on this earth. That's three and a half billion people. There's something so wrong in the way we are organizing our economic relationships as a human family. It's clear that we are in a long-term stagnation for the industrial era that we've come to know, but now that industrial era has given rise to a much more profound crisis. We have spewed massive amounts of carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere of this earth to claim this industrial way of life. And the result is 
We're now in real-time climate change, no longer a model or a theory. When I first began working on climate change in 1980, we only had one National Academy of Science report. Now climate change is at the door, it's in the house. And what's important about climate change, what I'm about to describe to you, if it were described in five minutes to everyone on this planet, we'd all be completely alarmed, terrified, motivated, and driven with one mission in mind, to save the earth, to save our species, to save our fellow creatures. Here's what's never described. Climate change changes the water cycles of the earth. That's what this is all about. It's never described. We are the watery planet. Our ecosystems are developed over millions of years based on the hydrological cycles, the cloud cycles that traverse our ecosystems. And here's the rub. For every one degree that the temperature on this earth goes up because of uh, global warming emissions, for every one degree that temperature is going up, the atmosphere is sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground because the heat is forcing the precipitation into the clouds. So we're getting more concentrated precipitation in the clouds, more violent, extreme, unpredictable water events, blockbuster winter snow. So when some congressperson gets up and says, well, all that snow, all that ice can't be global warming, they don't get it. More flooding all over the world every spring. More summer droughts and wildfires. Look at the United States and Canada in the last three years. Fires all over the California, British Columbia, across the West. Three hurricanes, I don't have to tell you, hit Florida, Louisiana, Texas, the Virgin Island, the Caribbean. This is happening all over the world. We are in real time. These water cycles are on an exponential runaway curve. And they are collapsing ecosystems. They can't catch up to the water cycle after millions of years. And here's the result. Our scientists tell us we are now in the sixth extinction event of life on Earth. It doesn't even make the headlines. People don't even know this is happening. It's the most dramatic story since we've been on this Earth. And our scientists tell us that in the next eight decades, we could lose over half the species of life on Earth. The last time we had an extinction event of this magnitude was 65 million years ago, and it took thousands of years. As my wife says, we're just not grasping the enormity of this moment. We recognize climate change. We're doing a little greenwashing. We're not there. It's clear we need a new economic vision for the world. It needs to be compelling. We need a game plan to deliver on that vision. It needs to be quick. And we need to move this game plan as fast and expediently in the developing world as the industrial world. We're going to have to be off carbon, not low carbon, off a carbon-based civilization in less than four decades if we have any chance of avoiding the abyss. We will not reverse climate change. This is here. We are in the era of resilience. This is going to be thousands of years, but at least we may be able to avoid catastrophe and hopefully regenerate the planet over thousands of years. So we need to step back and ask the question this morning, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? If we know how they occur, we're going to get a road map here with all of the first movers, and here you are. We're going to get a road map and a compass that can help us, help everyone else, chart a new journey for the human race really quickly. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. They're very interesting anthropologically. They share a common denominator. And that is, at a moment of time, three defining technologies emerge across a civilization, and they converge to create what we call in engineering a general purpose technology platform, an infrastructure that fundamentally transforms the way society manages, powers, and moves economic, social, and governing activity. What are those three technologies? Number one, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage our economic, social, and political life. That's obvious. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power our economic, social, and political life, obvious. Number three, new modes of mobility, transportation, logistics to more efficiently move our economic, social, and governing life. When communication revolutions converge with new energy regimes and new modes of mobility and logistics, it does fundamentally change the way we manage power and move economic life 
because it changes our temporal spatial orientation. It changes our economic models. It changes the way we govern. It even changes cognition and consciousness, fundamentally. Let me give you two quick examples. First Industrial Revolution, 19th century. Second Industrial Revolution, 20th century. Communication, energy, mobility, matrix is both. The Brits take us into the first Industrial Revolution. They move us out of the old communication, uh, manual print presses, Gutenberg, and they develop steam power printing, a huge leap forward in communication, cheap, quick, efficient print for mass publication of books and journals and public education and literacy. Then in the last part of that 19th century, the Brits lay out a telegraph system across the British Isles. Those communication technologies in Britain converge with a new source of energy, coal, harvested by a British invention, steam engine. And this is ingenious. They put the steam engine on rails, locomotives, national transport, hub-to-hub -hub traffic. The coming together is communication, energy, and mobility revolution, like all the revolutions that preceding it, changes the built environment. For the first time since Rome, we have a city, London, with a million people. And because of hub-to-hub -hub rain traffic, we concentrated populations in urban areas, and we built those five-story walk-ups and then apartment buildings and skyscrapers. All of that started in that first Industrial Revolution, 1880s, 1890s. Changed the whole built environment. Built environment. Second Industrial Revolution, 20th century United States. Centralized electricity, especially the telephone. The telephone, in some ways, is more extraordinary than the internet because for the first time in history, people are communicating at the speed of light across the planet. Later, radio and television. Those communication technologies in the United States converge with a new source of energy, Texas oil. Then Henry Ford put everybody in that internal combustion engine, cars, buses, and trucks, national roadways. And that changed our built environment. When we laid out the roadways and the interstate highway systems, it allowed us to move from that concentrated urban industrial life based on rail traffic to car and truck logistics and passenger traffic, suburbs, shopping malls, travel and tourism, the entire built environment was transformed over the last 40 years. That second industrial revolution, communication, energy, mobility, the built environment, commercial, residential, industrial, building infrastructure stock, took the whole world through the 21st to the 21st century and it peaked July 2008. Yeah, you remember that month if you're in the business community. In that month, Brent crude oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets as a, as a peak. The whole global economy turned down that month. Complete silence. It was eerie. Nothing moving in the ports or in the distribution centers. That was the great economic earthquake of the industrial era. The collapse of the financial 60 days later, the financial market collapse, that was an aftershock because you couldn't keep the fictional economy, investment community, alive when the real economy turned down. Why is this the earthquake for the industrial era? Because this entire civilization relies on fossil fuels, pesticides, fertilizers, construction materials, pharmaceutical products, synthetic fiber, power, transport, heat, and light. So when the price of oil goes over 80 a barrel, you watch all the other prices go up. When you get to a zone of 100 a barrel plus, the other prices become so prohibitive for goods and services, we start moving purchasing power down. So now we're in this growth shutdown, growth shutdown period. For example, oil prices go down um, when there's no economic activity to 30, 40 a barrel, right? And then when we start to regrow the inventory, the oil prices go up, but then the oil industry is fighting with each other. And so shale gas became competitive. So the oil company said, and OPEC, we're gonna shut off the oil and move that price again down to 30 a barrel. They did it, they wiped out the the, uh, uh, the fracking industry in 18 months. Now the oil prices go up to 60, so now the fracking folks are coming back in. This is a seesaw among the, those who are in a sunset fighting themselves to the death knell. This is not gonna go away. Wherever we have oil, with the exception now of the United States and Canada, we have failed states. Where do we go from here? Let me share an anecdote. When Chancellor Merkel uh, came into office and Chancellor, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first couple of weeks of her new government to help her address the question of how to grow the German economy and create some jobs on her watch. When I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the new Chancellor 
I said, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy when your businesses are plugged in to a second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion transport, and that infrastructure to manage power and move your economy, your society, and your governance, that infrastructure peaked in its productivity more than a decade ago in every industrial country. What I just said to you has never been raised or asked anywhere in American media, has it? You've never heard what I just said, anybody. And so our economists are asking, why is productivity declining? Here in America, we've got Silicon Valley, all these cool new digital products. I'm going to share a dirty little secret with you that economists are embarrassed about, ashamed of, and don't want to talk about. So I'm going to spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> What is the nature of productivity? We used to think there are two major factors in productivity, better machines and better workers. But when Robert Solow won his Nobel Prize on growth theory in the 80s, he let the little secret out. He said the problem is these two factors only amount to 14% of the productivity. So Robert Solow said, where's the other 86%? They can't find it. They don't know what it is. Does that shock you that economists don't know 86% of productivity comes from here? They, here's why they don't know. Productivity uh, is based on two laws, the laws of thermodynamics. These are the laws that govern the universe, and the laws I'm about to describe to you, every chemist and engineer knows, every biologist, every architect, every urban planner, because that's their language. Not a single business school in the world teaches these two laws I'm going to tell you about, including the Wharton School, and I've been there for over half a century. First law of thermodynamics, all the energy in the universe is constant since the Big Bang. No energy created, no energy destroyed. What we got is what we had since the Big Bang. Conservation law. Second law, while energy is constant in the universe, it changes form, but only in one direction. From concentrated, the Big Bang, to dispersed through the galaxies, from order to disorder. And entropy is a measure of the unavailable energy. So. What does this have to do with my conversation with the chancellor? We take available energy out of nature. Now remember, we have plenty of sun. So we got a lot of energy from the sun. But in terms of fixed matter and energy on this planet, what we have here is what we inherited when we blew off the sun. All those rare earths in your, in your phone, they're not coming back. And the metallic ore is not coming back. That's a fixed form of energy. So we take rare earths and metallic ore and fossil fuels, all sorts of things out of nature. We ship them, we store them, we produce things out of them, we consume them, we recycle them back to nature. At every step of conversion and taking nature's resources through our value chains, we have to embed a certain amount of energy and material, which is energy, into that good or service to transform it to the next stage of what it becomes on its journey through the value chain. But in the process at each step of that conversion, we're going to lose some of that energy, material and energy. This is called aggregate efficiency. It's a term in economics that economists don't even look at. Aggregate efficiency is the ratio of the potential work versus the actual useful work you get in eating conversion and what you lose in terms of the entropy bill. You with me? So it works the same way in nature. It works the same way in the universe. When a lion chases down an antelope in nature and kills it and devours it, about 10 to 20 percent of the energy in that antelope actually gets into the lion. The rest is heat loss, conversion, the consumption. So what does this have to do with my conversation with the Chancellor of Germany? <laughs> She's a physicist. And I said to her, the US started the second industrial revolution at about 3% aggregate efficiency in 1903. We got up to 14% aggregate efficiency by the late 1990s. Germany got up to 18.5% efficiency a little later. Anybody know who led the world? Japan, 20% aggregate efficiency, late 1990s. That was their ceiling. No country can get above the ceiling. What I said to the chancellor, you can have market reforms and labor reforms and fiscal reforms and all these other reforms, but if you're still plugging into that second industrial revolution infrastructure, centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel, nuclear power, internal combustion transport, and the built infrastructure with it, you can't get above 20% aggregate efficiency. And we now know, because we've done the numbers with the new generation of economists, when you plug in better machines, better workers, and then plug in aggregate efficiency, it amounts to much of the rest of your productivity. Henry Ford wasn't the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but he understood this. 
Every engineer understands this, every chemist, every biologist. Shameful. So on that first day, with the chance that we discussed, a third industrial revolution, a new convergence of communication, energy, and mobility to manage power and move economic activity and change the built environment, the building stock of Germany. At the end of the day, the Chancellor said, Mr. Rifkin, we're going to have this revolution for Germany. I'll report back to you in a few minutes on where, what we're doing. Here's what it is. The first industrial revolution was steam power. The second was analog electricity. The third is digital. There is no fourth industrial revolution, even though the World Economic Forums wants to brand it uh, in saying that if you have artificial intelligence or biotech, that's all digital. It's all digital. Here's what it is. It's an infrastructure shift. The Internet's in. Communication, 25 years since the World Wide Web, everyone here has a smartphone, correct? This was a revolution. Now this digital communication revolution to manage our economic, social, and political life is now converging with a digitalized renewable energy internet so everyone in the world can produce their own solar, wind, and other renewable energy off-grid or send it back to a digitalized energy internet just like we now share information, entertainment, and knowledge on a digital communication internet. Same principles, same technology. And now these two internets, the communication internet, the digital energy internet, they're converging with a digitalized, automated, GPS guided, and soon autonomous, driverless, road, rail, water, and air internet, electric and fuel cell vehicles, smart systems. These three internets, communication internet, the renewable energy internet, the mobility internet, all digital, come together as a single internet to manage power and move economic, social, and political life. They ride on top of a platform, these three internets, called the Internet of Things. Things. We're putting sensors in all of our ecosystems. So we have sensors now in the agricultural uh, fields and they're monitoring crops and soil salinity and water. We have um, sensors in factories monitoring the, the uh, data on the assembly line. We have smart homes, smart vehicles, smart retail, smart warehouses, now smart road systems. There are a lot of sensors out there. By 2030, we're going to have ubiquitous interconnectivity. We are creating a brain and a nervous system. The brain is satellite GPS guidance to synchronize and certain nervous system of the sensors. What this means, we're connecting the human race in real time. It's extraordinary. For the first time in history, the whole human race can come together in this global governance, of your will, in terms of a, a brain and nervous system and engage each other directly and eliminate a lot of the middlemen the giant, global, vertically integrated organizations that were the referees and determined the spoils and the inequality. And if we go to this system, it takes us from globalization top down in the 20th century, second industrial revolution, because that platform of communication, energy, and mobility, like the first industrial revolution, was centralized, top down, proprietary, closed with intellectual property, and vertically scaled to get the return on investment. This third industrial revolution is distributed, not centralized. The platform is open and transparent. The more people in the network, the more everybody values. You can try to control and monopolize it. You lose the productivity and generativity. And it laterally scales with millions of players. So this allows us to move from globalization top down to globalization. Every region, every community, every neighborhood, every business can engage each other around the world. They're starting to do it in real time in real time, virtually and physically, keeping our diversity but maintaining a more open, democratic form of economic commerce. This is what we call social entrepreneurialism. On the other hand, while this is exciting, it's also a little chilling. How are we going to deal with network neutrality when everyone's connected? How do we ensure governments don't purloin this for political purposes like hacking the U.S. elections? How do we ensure companies like Facebook and Alibaba and Twitter and Google don't try to privatize this, commodify all of our data, and take this over? How do we ensure privacy when everyone's connected? And how do we make sure uh, that we maintain the system against disruption by cybercrime, cyber terrorism, malware? This is the dark net, and it's impressive. And it's just as impressive as the bright net. And what I'm saying to you is the politics of the next three generations is going to be how do we address the dark net 
and make sure that this doesn't become an albatross, but rather a great leap forward for humanity. It's going to be a constant dialectical struggle here. But let's see what the, here's the bright side. Let's say you're a small or medium-sized business here in Florida. You can go up on this emerging Internet of Things. It's already developing. This is not theoretical. And you can get a transparent picture of data that's flowing. And then what you can do is take the data you care about on your value chain and strip it out from all the data coming through the system. Remember, when everyone has this data, this, is the, this evens the playing field. Even big companies didn't have big data like this. So you can just take a small mobile technology, queue into the data. Already you can start doing this with your energy, with your advanced meters, and you know, with your smart homes and businesses. This is starting. And then you can develop your own analytics, your own apps, based on your big data, so you can dramatically increase the aggregate efficiency and reduce your ecological footprint in your value chain to manage power and move your business or your community. Cheap. Some of the, uh, when, as we put in this digital revolution, some of the, the fixed costs are plummeting on an exponential curve and the marginal costs are heading toward zero. And that's the, the title of the new book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society. When digitalization starts to move your fixed costs down exponentially and your marginal costs down to near zero, it forces a shift in the capitalist system. We are making a shift from capitalist markets to capitalist networks, from sellers and buyers and owners and users to provide, from sellers and buyers and workers and, and owners, we're now moving to providers and users. We're moving from ownership to access. We're moving from consumerism to sustainability because when your marginal costs get very low, your profits are low. We always love marginal costs in business because then you can put out cheaper products, bring in more consumers, sell them more goods. But we never thought there'd be a revolution so powerful in its productivity that it could reduce marginal costs to near zero, in which case you have lower profits. So we're moving from markets to networks because in a market, every transaction is start and stop. But in a network, it's a flow 24-7 of services. So companies begin to blockchain together with this new technology, and you make money by small commissions on volumes of traffic moving through the webs. Just like stock, when you sell a stock, there's tiny commission, but there's millions of these shares going every hour, every minute. Some of the marginal costs are getting so low, they're heading to new zero, and it's creating the sharing economy. Capitalism gave birth to this little child, and it, we never thought in its mature age we'd see a birth. And this little sharing economy is unformed. Part of it's being absorbed to the capitalist system. There are the Ubers in the world, of course, but a lot of it is not. But I want to say to you this morning, this new sharing economy is the first new economic system to enter onto the world stage since capitalism and socialism. It's a remarkable event. We're still going to be formed. Already, young people are part, part of the day in the sharing economy, part of the day in the capitalist economy, part of the day they're producing and sharing for each other as prosumers, part of the day they're still in markets. Markets won't go away. Capitalism won't go away. It's going to move to networks. But the sharing economy is going to be side by side, and you're going to have more than one choice here. You're going to be able to go back and forth in your choices every day. And there'll be a lot of interaction between capitalist networks and sharing economy. So we already know this is here. Uh, when the book came out, Zero Marginal Cost Society, some folks said, oh, this is way off in the future. And I had to smile. I said, wait a minute. We've got 3.5 billion people now on the communication internet as prosumers. Right now, this morning, they're producing and sharing their own music. That Korean um, uh, dancer, music guy, remember, I can't do his thing. Remember three years ago, that Korean performance artist? What did it cost him to take a digital recorder, do that little song and dance? Th 3 billion people come to his website. It didn't cost them a thing. All they needed to power up, have a service provider. We have millions of young people producing and sharing YouTube videos open source. We have millions of young people every day producing their own social media, their own news. We have Wikipedia, the sixth largest website in a year, operates on $50 million of, of charity and foundation money a year, or grants. And we're constructing the knowledge of the world, all democratized. The whole human race is engaged in constructing knowledge. And the peer review is so accurate because apparently everyone has nothing else to do but to find out if someone else is making a mistake and check them, <laughs> that we're there already. To, and we've got millions of young people taking massive open online college courses taught by their best professors. They're getting college credits, zero marginal cost. Whole industries have been disruptive, newspapers, magazines, book publishing, television. But whole new industries have emerged, not just Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Thousands of startups and new companies are creating the platforms and the apps. They're running the big data. We thought there'd be a firewall. 
And while zero marginal cost would affect the virtual world of information, news, knowledge, and entertainment, we actually didn't think it'd go over the firewall to the physical world. The Internet of Things takes it over the firewall, things, to energy, to mobility, and then to the built environment, commercial, residential, industrial stock, and everything that plugs into it. We now have millions of people around the world producing their own solar and wind and other renewable energy and near zero marginal cost. We now have millions of young people in car sharing services, electric and fuel cell in the next few years. They're going to be driverless and autonomous within four. Very low marginal cost. Let's go back to Germany. So here's what's been going on since the first meeting with the chancellor. I've been working with Sigmar Gabriel, the vice chancellor, who's now the foreign minister, actually. And uh, so we're 35% of our electricity now is solar and wind. Amazing. We'll be 100% before 2040. Last weekend, the New York Times reported, if you saw it, that it was negative prices. They had to pay the consumers for the electricity because it was too much. <laughs> All right? Too much. So what's interesting about um, solar and wind, and someone should tell the government in Washington because they're taking us back to 1950. They're patching up the second industrial revolution road system and bridges, and then they're going back to oil drilling and coal. But let me explain to them what's going to happen to this government and to this society. They got to listen to this. The fixed costs of solar and wind are on an exponential curve just like computer chips. Now, when I was a kid in the 1940s, we didn't have any computers. The first computer was at my university, UNIVAC, the University of Pennsylvania. At the time, IBM said we'll need five computers for the world, which was a very optimistic forecast, actually, at the time. <laughs> we didn't anticipate the Intel chip. Engineers are able to double the cost, the, double the capacity, half the cost every two years. Now, China has a smartphone right now, $25, more computing power than sent our astronauts to the moon. So if you're in a little village in the Amazon, you're going to have more computing power than sent our people to the moon. Do you think that's a sea change? Do you think that's going to change the world? Absolutely. Do you think any large company is going to be able to stop that? No. Not going to happen. So what's interesting is solar and wind have been on a curve. You know, if you know exponential curves and you double them, the first 20, nothing's going on. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 60, 400, 28, 256, 5, 12, nothing's going on. You get to that 21st curve, we're now there. It goes wild. A solar watt, you older folks remember, a fixed solar watt, $78. One watt, fixed cost, 1979, $78. What is it this morning? Under 50 cents. What is it in 18 months from now? 35 cents. We now have power and utility companies, some of my global consortium, big ones. They are, in the last 18 months, buying long-term 20-year contracts right now for solar and wind, because we know the exponential curve. They're buying the contracts for four cents a kilowatt hour. And some now are going to three cents a kilowatt hour. And here's the story you're not being told. We now have $100 trillion in stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry. It makes no difference if they open up all the oil drilling. It's not going to happen. Citibank put out a report a year and a half ago. We have $100 trillion in stranded assets because solar and wind are now at four cents and three cents, and it keeps going down a kilowatt hour. And the marginal cost is zero. The sun has not sent us a bill in Germany, and the wind has not invoiced us yet. All right? <laughs> so what happens when German businesses plug into an infrastructure of communication, energy, and mobility, and the energy they use in every single conversion on their value chain is near zero? How does a second industrial revolution country with coal, oil, natural gas, <laughs> nuclear power plants, old highway systems compete with that? Can't be done. This is a very disruptive revolution. So, What's interesting is um, Citibank says $100 trillion in stranded assets. The president of the Bank of, I of England uh, a week ago, it's the front page of the Financial Times. I guess everyone's asleep in the media in Washington. Front page, he said, we've got stranded assets. This is a big deal. Everybody pay attention. So this is the biggest bubble in history. How do we deal with stranded assets, the pipelines, the drilling, the exploration rights, all of that stranded, you can't compete. It is over. But does that mean it's over for uh, the energy companies? Not necessarily, but look who's producing all the new power in Germany, electricity cooperatives. Workers, farmers, small businesses, they all got loans from the bank. Uh, they put in the electricity, pay back all the loans. Now we don't need to feed in tariffs because we're down to four cents a kilowatt hour. 
The big power companies are producing less than 5%. Does that mean they're out of business? Not necessarily, they have to change their business model. So about five years ago, I introduced a new business model to the four major power companies in Germany, EMBW, RWE, Eon, Vattenfall. We thought they were invincible 10 years ago. What happened to them is what happened to the music industry, newspapers, book publishing, et cetera. All those electricity cooperatives came in, laterally scaled. The problem is these big companies were very good at scaling centralized energy, which created a lot of, needed a lot of scientific, technical knowledge, et cetera. But the sun and wind are everywhere, so you have to actually collect them wherever you live and work. That's the buildings, the built environment, your barns, your sheds, your commercial, your residential, your neighborhoods, your infrastructure. There's no companies in the world that can capture all that. So where I said that we had a debate with the president of Eon about five years ago, he's still there. And I said, you're not going to leave the second industrial revolution tomorrow morning, but you're going to have to be in a third industrial revolution business portfolio and make a 30 year shift very quickly between the second and the third. In a third industrial revolution, you make more money by not generating any electricity because all of us are going to generate the electricity. You'll make money by managing the energy internet and by selling less and less electricity, you make more and more money. He said, I'm lost. <laughs> I said, what you do is you're going to set up partnerships with thousands of businesses. You're going to manage the energy flowing through their value chains. You're going to help them with their analytics and big data through those energy flows into their buildings, their infrastructure, their value chains. And you're going to help them increase their aggregate efficiency, reduce their ecological footprint, and they're going to share their productivity gains back with you in performance contracts. Five years ago, he went like this. Last year, he went like this. He's put his fossil fuel and nuclear on the market. No bidders stranded. He waited too long. There's no one bidding. RWE, the other one of the two, the big four, they've gone with us. They have their legacy fossil fuel nuclear. They're now in energy services along the model we did. Uh, third one, BMBW is now with us. GDF Suez, now NG is with us. EDF is helping us. Um, our global group is doing the build out in northern France and Netherlands and Luxembourg. They've joined us in northern France. They're helping us lay down the, the energy internet. They're not leaving nuclear tomorrow, but the government has just said to them, unless you have a plan to get out of all of this right now, the government owns most of it, we're going to do it ourselves. This is the Macron government. This is in real time disruption. Yeah, Wow is right. It's power to the people, literally and figuratively, power to the people. We overdid it in 1968, but millennials have no memory, so you can reinvent it again. <laughs> Be my guest. Take it. It's not just Europe, now China. When, Pres when Premier Chi, uh, President Xi and Premier Li came into office, uh, Premier Lee, I was quite surprised. I had never done any work there. I was actually shocked. He put out his official biography, which is a new thing in China, and he announced that he had read the Third Industrial Revolution book. Evidently, someone had slipped him a book when he got on an airplane in Germany back to China, and he was stuck there in the cabin with no good movies to watch. I don't know. He read the book. Just pure luck. And he, in his biography, said that he informed the central government of China to begin moving on the narrative I'm laying out to you today. I've been doing formal visits to China ever since. They move so quick. This is what I want our political leaders to understand and our business leaders here. Eleven weeks after my first formal visit to China, the chairman of the state electricity grid, the state grid, announced $82 billion, now in this five-year plan now, $82 billion to totally digitalize the electricity grid of China so millions of Chinese people using their own solar and wind, because they're the leading producers of it, they sell in the domestic market and share what they're not using back to the grid. Yeah. Watch the Europe, watch China. Where is the United States of America? So the coming together of the communication internet and the energy internet makes possible the, the digitalized, automated, GPS-guided, and soon completely driverless road, rail, water, and air internet, electric fuel cell vehicles. Here's the deal. We built the whole global economy in the 20th century around making and selling automobiles and all the under industries from travel, tourism, shopping malls, suburban build, that's all automobile. Here's the problem. The millennials actually don't want to own automobiles. That's grandma and grandpa, two cars sitting in the driveway doing nothing, waxing them every month. The millennials want access to mobility and digital car sharing services, not ownership of vehicles in old fashioned 20th century markets. Where are my millennials? Do I have this right? You're messing it all up here. <laughs> you already are in the revolution. Because for every car you're sharing, we're eliminating 15 cars. 
Now, the auto industry is aware of this, the transportation industry, so we introduced a new model. They're not leaving the second industrial revolution tomorrow. They're still selling millions of cars and trucks and buses, but they've got to have that transition model because we're going to eliminate 80% of the vehicles, these are the new studies we have, in the next 20, 30 years. The remaining vehicles, about 200 million will be left, they're going to be electric fuel cell, in smart road, rail, water, and air, completely driverless, near zero marginal cost, solar and wind. In 2019, in the United States, all the major car companies will have electric across their line and hybrid. I'm uh, uh, going to be with um, um, EJ uh, Beijing, electric vehicles based, EV uh, uh, Beijing is the largest producer of uh, electric vehicles. They're producing 5 million. I'm advising them, and uh, they're putting out 5 million vehicles in this five-year plan. 5 million, they just started. So does this mean this is the end for the transport companies? No, they need to change their business model. So let me introduce Ford and Daimler. I'm working with both their leaderships, Daimler. So, and both of these brought us the second industrial revolution. Those are the two companies that brought us into it. So about a year and a half ago, uh, Wolfgang Bernhardt, the chairman of Daimler Trucks said, join us in Germany, we want to introduce the mobility internet. So I laid out this narrative and then Wolfgang got up and he had told people we didn't know this. Apparently, they had outfitted quietly 300,000 Daimler trucks with sensors all over the outside of the trucks. They're on the roadways in real time now. These are mobile big data centers picking up traffic conditions, weather flows, warehouse availability in real time. And then that data is going to be available with analytics so that it can be used by anyone in the logistics industry and Daimler will help them so they can dramatically increase their aggregate efficiency in their logistics in sending goods from A to B, dramatically reduce their ecological footprint because the actual waste in logistics is probably only second to agriculture as uh, the most inefficient systems we've got today. Smart. So here's the cool thing about this. <laughs> so after he introduced this, they went to a video feed. You can see this on Google. And they, um, they had a helicopter in live time and they had three trucks on the expressways and we're all uh, waving to the drivers in the truck and Wolfgang says to the drivers, take your hand off the wheel, take your feet off the pedal. These were software analysts and they put their computer screens on there and they're monitoring the data and the trucks platoon together autonomously like a train, real time, right now, on the European expressways. Ford, Ford joined us, Mark Fields in January asked if I would come to the first day of the auto show, the CEO. Uh, we introduced uh, a film uh, that's coming out with Vice called The Third Industrial Revolution next month. And then Ford announced that they were in the mobility unit. They're still going to sell millions of vehicles. This isn't tomorrow morning, but they've got to start making a shift in, to be in two portfolios. So Ford is moving toward autonomous vehicles. There will be provider user vehicles that can send you or logistics, but they are now working with cities to make it seamless so they work uh, with uh, the cities, uh, with the apps, to bring it together with the bike sharing and the, tra and the transportation and the pedestrian sharing, so it's a seamless network. I'm sure you're looking at it here in Orlando, correct? All right. This is smart. These are first movers. Com Edison, Chicago, Ann Primajori, probably the top CEO in the country. She's the flagship for Exelon Power. She's now moving with us on these plans. Again, they're not leaving the second industrial revolution, but it's sunsetting. They're moving into new opportunities, first movers. They don't want to be paralyzed and stranded assets. So all of the shifts I've just talked to you have huge import because the Internet of Things starts with the buildings. We have the communication internet, the energy internet, the mobility internet to manage power and move society, but the Internet of Things is not the cloud. It's the buildings. It's every home, it's every office, it's every factory, it's every barn, it's every shed. It's the infrastructure that goes along with our built environment. That's where the sensors are. So, in Europe, we have a plan, Smart Europe. It was announced last February. 641 billion euros, the Juncker Fund, we mean business here. That's our infrastructure plan, 641 billion. And not, should we let private companies set up our public infrastructure and see if they can privatize the roads, the bridges, and everything else? That's absurd. Those are public goods. So we have Smart Europe. In China, we have a plan. We developed our team with China called Internet Plus. China, it's the same plan. And at the centerpiece are the buildings. We have to retrofit every single building in Europe and China. Deep retrofits. 
66% energy savings by retrofits. We have to put in the insulation. Early this morning, I was with the key insulation companies, back around 7.30 this morning. We have to put in the, the, heart, the insulation, the glass, um, the door replacements. That is a huge amount of infrastructure. Every single building has to be made efficient by retrofitting, or you can't turn them into nodes. In the, first, in the third industrial revolution, the buildings are nodes. They're not just where you work or live, they are nodes. They are the distributed big data centers so we can distribute data across society and it isn't all in the purview of Facebook, Google, and Alibaba. Everybody shares in a public distributed infrastructure building to building, you got it? Then those buildings are retrofitted, they are big data centers, they are micro power generation sites, they are electric charging stations, they're totally connected with IoT across cities, regions, and continents. The Internet of Things is the built environment. And so, where do we get the money for this? We had this conversation in, in the EU, and I said, look, we've got the money. The United States has the money. Everybody has the money. The question is, what are we doing with the money we have? For example, in the EU, we spent about 741 billion euros in infrastructure development in 2012. That's a particularly bad depression year, recession year. 741 billion, but we spent it on the old infrastructure, centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel, nuclear power, internal combustion transport, and we can't get any more productivity out of it, and we are moving to more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and we don't have jobs. So I said, patch it up, if they're listening in Washington today, patch it up, we don't want to go over bridges that collapse on us, and roads that are sinkholes, but if we put at least half of the monies into a new third industrial revolution for a millennial generation, digital natives, we'll be there in every region of the world in 40 years. And I remind you, we put down the whole first industrial revolution uh, from 1860 in our country, 1850 with the railroads to 1890 in 30 years. We put the second industrial revolution together, the juvenile infrastructure, the road system, the automobiles, the pipelines, the electricity from 1905 to 29. Then we had a hiatus with the Depression and War, and then we built out the interstates. We did both of them in less than 40 years. There's no reason why we can't do the third industrial revolution in an even shorter time. But we have to have the narrative, we have to have the story, we have to have the will and commitment, and we can't be paralyzed. So, smart Europe, Internet plus China. How do you finance this? In Europe, we're setting up public bonds in each region. And the reason we're doing this, there are a lot of folks that would like to retrofit buildings, but you can't scale it. It doesn't make any money when you're scaling one building at a time. So in Europe, we realize that the way to scale this out is every region has to create a roadmap that customizes to the region, but has this overall architecture, communication internet, energy internet, mobility internet, built IoT infrastructure, then you customize to the region, and we started a new experiment. And that is, the regions are no longer the, um, the um, deciders, they're the facilitators. So we have three test regions, all of northern industrial France, Haute de France, Rotterdam to The Hague, 23 cities, all of Luxembourg, our financial capital. And we said, we'll come in with our global team of scientists and engineers, the best in the world, but we won't do a plan for you. We will work with you, but you have to bring the whole region in, not for just meetings, do you like this, do you agree, focus groups. You've got to bring in people for a year. You've got to have at least 300 on your primary committees, your universities, your think tanks, your, your businesses, your local governments, all there, and maybe several thousand in your subsidiary committees, and together you are going to collaborate and not compete, and you're going to create an incredibly sy systemic and integrated master plan and roadmap to transform your society. And this has never happened before on this scale. And at first they were doubtful, then they thought this isn't going to happen, and then they did it. And if you can do it in northern France, which is the rust belt, the, the old steel belt, the mining belt, and you can do it in the Netherlands, you can do it here. And the reason I say this is important is once you have a road map like we have in these three regions, and you come and visit, we bring delegations, then they're ready to deploy at scale. So now in northern France, we're taking whole social housing areas because they've already signed up. And an entire commercial district, an old manufacturing district, they're all signed up because it's their plan. We're not trying to lobby them or sell something to them. And it's all local businesses. So what happens is you set up ESCOs for public bonds. You ready? 
And those public bonds are committed only to the transformation of the building stock. So you set up ESCOs between uh, architects, uh, construction companies, uh, asset management companies, ICT, transport, logistics, utility, because they're all part of these transformations and they blockchain. And together, they get these public bonds and first they retrofit entire scale building stock. You with me? Pay back by the performance contracts. We can audit in advance so you can't default. We know exactly how the return will be in terms of the energy efficiencies. Then these ESCOs all blockchained. They then come in and put the renewables on buildings or around the sites. With those public bonds, they pay back by the energy performance. Then they come in and they put in the electric charging stations, same thing, pay back by the energy performance. The blockchains allow the companies to share in terms of how they set up the management. All local. You can get global companies to help, but local. Finally, they put in uh, the Internet of Things technology, not just the advanced meters, all of the technologies, and they connect building to building like Wi-Fi across regions, across continents. All regional, local, but then regions connect, and that's the nature of the platform. Region to region, distributed, transparent, open, and networked. Not top down. Not rocket science. As my wife says, this isn't rocket science. This is a business model that works. We know it works, and we have a lot of global companies engaged across these sectors. Let me uh, spend the last 15 minutes saying I don't think it's just about technology. Some of you know I've been critical of many technologies over my lifetime. I don't think just because it can be done, it should be done, and I don't think technology is fate, and I'm not a Silicon Valley utopian by any means. Technology enables, and unfortunately there are periods in history where you have the right combination. There are times where there is no new technology infrastructure and you have collapse of societies. That happened in Rome. There was nothing to replace it. But what we really have to change is consciousness. We have to have a transformation of human consciousness in one generation that separates the millennials from their children, or we're not going to get there. I am only guardedly hopeful that we can do this, but I will say this. When I meet with heads of state, and I meet with local mayors or business, I say, do you, if you have another plan, would you tell me what it is? Tell me what it is. What's your plan? I always get silence or go back to the second industrial revolution. We know this will work, and we know it will address climate change, because we know that we can get everybody into an energy internet, you're going to have solar on your roofs, in your, in your windows, in your glass, in your paint in the next few years. We know everyone's going to create their own solar and wind. We know that we're going to move to these electric and fuel cell vehicles based on that solar and wind. We know we're going to have sharing. So you, you produce goods and services, and we're going to share the homes, we're going to share the cars, we're going to share the toys, we're going to have a circular economy, nothing needs to go to the landfill. We know this is going to happen. But we've got to change consciousness. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of where I'm guardedly hopeful but that's all. I won't be here to see this. You younger people will. I hope you make it. I think it's possible, but it's going to require a commitment that we've never seen by the human race up to this point in time. Let me give you a few reasons why I'm guardedly hopeful. Number one, toys. Toys, toys, toys. So, you know, the commercial toy was invented in Ravensburg, Germany, the beginning of the modern era. So traditionally, parents bring home a toy to say to their little six-year-old daughter, Santa Claus didn't bring this toy. It's not Christmas. We bought the toy, toy. It's your property. It's not your brother's toy. It's not your sister's toy. Your toy. Take care of it. You're responsible. Remember this? So the first thing that little girl heard is, not my brother and sister's toy. That's very important because then she's going to negotiate. She has power for the first time in her life. She's got status. They'll never see that toy. They'll never play with it unless I get something in return. She's learning a crude kind of market system property-based relationship. I have no problem with that. I teach in a business school. But now we've got a generation of millennial parents in their 30s and they're in toy websites. One subscription, they can take out any toy by age category, and they're bringing home the toy to their six or seven-year-old daughter and saying, another little child played with this toy, had a lot of fun with it, took good care of it, because she knew one day you'd want to play with it. You're going to take good care of it, because someday another little kid's going to play with it. The child is learning a toy is not a possession to defend. It's not a status symbol. It doesn't define you. It's an experience in a moment of time, then it moves on in a circular economy. This is the kind of transition that's really revolutionary. 
And finally, I've seen three markers, and I, I'm only guardedly hopeful on these, that suggest to me the change. Millennials have a somewhat of a different conception of how they view freedom, power, and their sense of identity to community. Freedom. I grew up to believe that freedom is, uh, in the kind of Anglo-American tradition, is the ability to be autonomous, self-sufficient, not beholden to others, independent. I ought to be able to make what I want out of my life and not interfere with others, and they don't interfere with me. I'm an island to myself, correct? Millennials, what I just described would be death to millennials. The idea that success means to be autonomous, exclusive power is ex exclu ex free, uh, uh, freedom is exclusivity, and autonomy is death. Take away the smartphones and you will see real withdrawal. They're connected. For them, flourishing, to be free and to flourish, is directly relationship to the communities you're embedded in, the relationships you have, the networks you're engaged. And the more networks you're in, the more the network values itself, and the more everyone gets value, and there's no win or loser, everybody wins. Different idea of freedom. Inclusivity, not exclusivity. Access, not ownership. They're starting to change the way they look at power. I grew up in the, to believe that power is a pyramid. That's all it can be. Now, in Occupy, the older generation, just for them, as they said, well, no, we got the 99% and the 1%. But for the young people who grew up on the internet as digital natives, power are networks that are lateral, transparent, and open, and not proprietary and closed. They're not vertical pyramids. It's a completely different use of technology. Finally, and I think this is most important, we're seeing a difference in the sense of identity. I grew up in a post-Westphalian world. Very simple. The nation state is sovereign, and every nation has citizens, and every citizen is a sovereign unit in the nation state, an autonomous agent. And every citizen is a sovereign in, uh, in the nation state, competes with other citizens in the marketplace for scarce resources, zero-sum game. The nation state is sovereign. They represent all the individual citizens sovereign, and they compete with other nation states in the marketplace and the battlefield, scarce resources, zero-sum game. And I remind us that we fought two world wars and millions of people died. The first world war over coal and the second over oil and coal in the Ruhr Valley. So what we're seeing among young millennials is something different. They are moving from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness. This is happening rather quick among the middle class around the world at least. And that is, they're coming home, 15-year-olds, and they're saying, why is dad using so much water while he's shaving? We're in drought here in California. They're the little biosphere police, actually. <laughs> Dad's locking the door now. They're saying to their parents, why is that TV on in the other room? We haven't been there for three weeks. We're wasting the electricity here. Why two cars in the driveway? Why not drive one and eliminate the other car-sharing services? They're saying to their parents. And this is the one I'm particularly fond of. Young people are saying to their parents, where'd the hamburger come from here on the plate for dinner? Yeah, you're getting this at home. Did this come from a rainforest? Did they have to destroy the trees for six inches of topsoil to graze one cow, four years of topsoil for one, cat, one burger? And what they understand is if those trees are destroyed in that rainforest, uh, lots of species of rare animals that live only in that rainforest go extinct, up the numbers. And if the trees are no longer there to graze the soil for that cow, for the hamburger, they're not there absorbing CO2 from industrial emissions. And that means some farmer can't feed her children in a subsistence farm 10,000 miles away from the hamburger because she's getting wiped out by spring floods and summer droughts and wildfires. This is not academic. This is happening all over the world. The kids are learning ecological footprint. And I remind you that while the number one cause of global warming emissions is buildings, and number three is transport, and we spend a lot of time on it, no one's spending any time on number two, which is cattle and beef production. When I wrote that book in 1990, even the environmental movement would not endorse that idea. 1990. So these young people are beginning to understand the ecological footprint, that everything we do intimately affects everyone else. It's not academic that our well-being depends on the well-being of all of the other periodicities that uh, allow us to be a synchronized planet.
This is a heady change from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness. So what I would say to you, everyone here, you're already the first movers. The Green Builder Media, you brought together people from all over the United States. You are the ones that are putting in the solar homes and you're retrofitting the buildings and you're creating all of these green projects. But here's my, my warning of where we need to go. We have 7,000 cities in the Covenant of Mayors climate uh, plan. And it's co-chaired by Michael Bloomberg and Meryl Sefcovich, the Vice President of the European Commission, who I work with, and, and the Secretariats in Brussels. And here's what we've really realized. You can go to cities all over the world and they have all sorts of beautiful little projects, lead buildings, hydrogen buses, nothing's happening. And the reason is we are fixed with the idea that it's just a matter of incentivizing a particular product or a particular project. That's not an infrastructure shift. You'll never make the transition. What we've learned in these three regions is you have to bring a whole region together and you have to see the infrastructure itself come on, which is the communication internet, converging with the energy internet, the mobility internet, the internet of things, and all the buildings become your retrofitted stock to move this transition laterally across regions. If you don't get there, you won't get there. And we will end up saying, why did all these nice little projects not succeed? They have to be integrated. So my hope here in this room, you're the first movers. Most of you have dedicated your whole life to making this transition. We need now to tell this story. It's not enough for Europe and China to be engaged. Where is the United States of America? We have little pockets, Austin to San Antonio, California, Oregon, Washington State, Vermont, and New England. But we now have an infrastructure debate moving in Washington. Democrats and Republicans are talking about patching up the bridges and the roads while we've opened up oil drilling and coal. It's outrageous. It's shameful. But more importantly, this is the death knell for the opportunities for a millennial generation in the 21st century. If we lose four or eight years here, we are going to be so far behind the curve, we will never, ever catch up. So what we need to do is we need to double our commitment. And I'm sure that many of you are already working 24-7, I know. We have to double our commitment, and we have to be able to move from talking about the projects to talking about the paradigm and the story and the narrative and move this digital third industrial revolution into every community, every region, every state of this country. And if we can do that over the next five years, then we join together with the European Union and China, and the three of these great political units can together help bring the world into the 21st century. And the goal here, we create a more resilient society. We hopefully don't go to the abyss. We begin to use the best social ecological systems modeling to bring our social and economic um, realities in tune with the ecosystems we're responsible for. And finally, each of us takes responsibility in our region for our 19 kilometers of the biosphere. Every region rewilds parts of its region, it puts in the digital infrastructure, and it gives hope to a digital generation who already have the skills, they're digital natives. Yes, we can proceed into a new future and create an ecological society. I'm hoping that these first movers, if you don't, no one else will. And so we want to work with you and encourage you to take all the efforts you're doing and spread this everywhere across Florida, across America, make this happen for our children's generation. Thank you. Thank you.